not only will he be able to seize the canal, he sees a way to bring about NASA's downfall. If you bomb Egypt, you create panic within the country, you link this to an invasion, the Israeli invasion, and uh, the new government will emerge, and Nasser will be no more. The document agreed on here, known as the Sevres Protocol, puts down in black and white the covert plan to invade Egypt and fool the world. When this document finally emerged 40 years later, it confirmed how a British Prime Minister had deceived the world and deliberately engineered a war in the Middle East. On October the 29th, the Israelis land a parachute brigade deep in the Sinai, as agreed at Sev. But the Israeli advance towards the canal is a fake, designed purely to convince the world that the canal is threatened. It was about 40 kilometers from the canal, or 45 kilometers, but when you look at big maps, then you can say, ah, the drop was not far from the canal. That was enough to fulfill the needs of the British to say, the canal is threatened. We didn't go into the motives and consideration of France and England, because our aims were clear. The following day, Britain and France issue their ultimatum, as planned at Sev. Israel and Egypt are to cease fighting, or the two Western powers will intervene. Eden knows this is an ultimatum that NASA cannot accept. On the evening of the 30th of October, the ultimatum expires. Shortly afterwards, NASA hears planes in the skies above Cairo. As the bombs fall, a frightened Egyptian population rush to join civilian militias. Most of us, the young people, decided that we're going to defend the country. We really didn't know what we were going to do because our training was very cursory. It included one clip of live ammunition. When we joined, the first thing they did was they gave us those cases of Kalashnikov rifles right out, out of the boxes with grease. And they said, okay, here's your rifle, you know. This makeshift civilian army now waits for the arrival of British paratroopers. You hear a lot of fire, people firing rifles and firing in the air. We didn't know what, you know, everybody is a parachutist, you know. Any noise, you think somebody had just come from the sky. So it was a very, very tense moment, and we were scared. But Cairo, where Talat Badrawi and other volunteers are waiting, is not the target for the British paratroop assault. Port Said, at the mouth of the canal, is where Britain will begin the reconquest of Egypt. After five days of aerial bombardment, 668 British paratroopers land in Port Said. The city quickly finds itself under occupation, but its population is determined not to give Eden the easy victory he has anticipated. And then they landed. The British landed in Port Said. So of course we wanted to wipe them out. All the people have arms and guns and machine guns. They shoot at the aeroplanes. And every Egyptian people are ready to sacrifice himself in order to, to defend his country. As the resistance mobilizes, the British Prime Minister is insisting to the world that his actions are right, legal, and morally sound. All my life, I've been a man of peace. Working for peace. Striving for peace, negotiating for peace. And I'm still the same, with the same conviction, the same devotion to peace. But I'm utterly convinced that the action we have taken is right. As Eden is speaking, Port Said is burning. The war is barely a week old. Hundreds of Egyptian civilians have already been killed in the bombing campaign, and more die in the street fighting that follows.
It is at this point that Eden hopes a terrified Egyptian population will rise up to overthrow Nasser. They do not understand what Egypt is. They were completely wrong. The Egyptians were, all of them were, were uh, one heart behind Nasser. When they feel a, f a foreign threat, the people come together. And this is what happened exactly. The Egyptian armed forces may be hopelessly outgunned, but Nasser and his government remain in Cairo. Plans are made to begin a guerrilla war should the army be overwhelmed. A popular army to fight in the canals, in the streets, in the countryside, in the ports. We were hiding arms all over the villages, everywhere in Egypt, so that even if, it, if the troops they came to invade Egypt, we will fight, we will uh, resist. The Suez Crisis suddenly increases the temperature of the Cold War. Nikita Khrushchev sees his ally Nasser coming under attack in Cairo and realizes that Soviet prestige appears to be crumbling on two continents. He feels that the West is taking advantage of him when he is down. That the British and the French are watching his troubles in Eastern Europe and see that they have an opportunity to deal with one of his allies now because he is distracted. And his reaction was the reaction of a political leader who is fearful, surprised, and angry at the same time. He threatens the West with the doomsday option. He said to the world, that don't be surprised if the consequence of your actions is that nuclear weapons will fall on London and Paris. This was the first time they had ever made a nuclear threat. Suddenly, it looks like Eden's adventure in Egypt is going to end in Armageddon. Somebody had a uh, radio and we heard on that that the Russians were threatening um, to drop bombs on London and the Chinese might be about to join in too. And at that moment I did think this is really going to be the Third World War. The threat of nuclear war concentrates minds in Washington where President Eisenhower is already furious with the Prime Minister. The United States was not consulted in any way about any phase of these actions, nor were we informed of them in advance. He was so angry with the British. I mean, it was really angry with, with the British. They had gone around his back and colluded with these other guys. In front of the world, the American Secretary of State condemns his country's oldest ally. I doubt that any delegate ever spoke from this forum with as heavy a heart as I have brought here tonight. Eden had the awful realization that he had totally misjudged the American aspect of the affair. Eden's plans are unraveling fast. He has not anticipated this level of hostility from the Americans, nor from his own people. If he is sincere in what he is saying, then he is too stupid to be a prime minister. There was demonstrations in London as big as demonstrations in Egypt. And there is only one way in which they can even begin to restore that tarnished reputation. And that is to get out, get out, get out. As opposition across the world mounts, morale in Port Said soars. People around the world were backing you. In the West, we had the public opinion with the Egyptians. And Eden realizes he has fatally miscalculated the reaction of the Egyptian population to invasion. Nasser refuses to go into hiding. He determines instead to rally his people after Friday prayers at Cairo's ancient Al-Azhar Mosque. And 
بنبني بلدنا بنبني تاريخنا بنبني مستقبلنا In London, Eden is feeling the strain. He has failed to win the hearts and minds of the Egyptian people. Nasser is more popular than ever. And now comes the decisive blow. Britain's currency reserves have been hemorrhaging since the bombing campaign began as dealers all over the world dump sterling. In those days, Britain was the banker of the sterling area. Britain saw the immediate danger of the bottom falling out of that. When Eden appeals to the Americans for financial help, President Eisenhower makes sure there will be no room for misunderstanding this time. Eisenhower was quite firm. He said, as soon as you agree to get out and really are getting out, we'll help you, but not a minute before. The arrival of United Nations contingents at Port Said causes a sensation that nearly develops into a riot by excitable Egyptians. Of course, I was jumping with joy. When the last British soldier left, we used to say, go to hell. Plans are made for United Nations troops to replace the British and French on the ground. The ceasefire is a humiliating climb down for Eden and his commanders. I have to say that most of the officers in the regiment took it as a mortal blow. I think it was very, very hard on the professional soldiers who had gone into this uh, enterprise in good faith, thought that this was going to be the final war of the British Lion, and suddenly found that it was just a sort of uh, mingy little squeak that had achieved nothing. <laughs> Eden never returned to frontline politics, and his reputation never recovered from taking Britain to war in the Middle East under false pretenses. Britain's reputation was equally damaged. Well, it, it was a total, utter disaster. And it took us 20 years to recover our rightful position as someone who was not the lord and master in that area, but a friend to those states which had emerged after many centuries when we and the French had ruled the roost. In Egypt, the Suez Crisis was the making of NASA. The 23rd of December, 1956, dawned beautifully. It was the first day after the liberation of Fort Sinai, and the whole city was out to celebrate Victory Day. At that time, he was, uh, you know, he was God, <laughs> I have to tell you. President Nasser is a historic hero. In the aftermath of the Suez Crisis, Nasser was fated all over the Arab world. Here at last was a leader who could stand up to the West and win. And the Arabs at that time started to realize that Nasser was the hero who was sent by God to retrieve uh, the Arabs from uh, many years of subordination. Ordinary Egyptians have drawn their own lessons from the Suez Crisis. There is a great difference between resistance and terrorism. I was a patriot defending my country. I am a human being. I have dignity. I don't accept any foreigner to dominate me. Or else, I'm a slave. Right or wrong? <laughs> 